why we should keep questioning. As many of you know, the word philosophy comes from the Greek philosophia, which translates as love of knowledge, or, more simply, wanting to know. This essential meaning of philosophy shows how important it is not to restrict it to academic circles, but to make it accessible, to make it practiced, to make it live by individuals, societies, and humanity in general. Why do I say that? Loving and having knowledge is important because they help us survive and thrive. How do we gain knowledge? The first lines of acquisition are of course our senses. They may trigger some automatic responses in us. But at some point we have to make sense of our senses to go beyond instinctive reactions. And that is where our mind comes in, wondering and asking questions. Questions like, what is this? How does it compare to something else? Why does it do what it does? How does it work? And how can we use it for our purposes? Institutional philosophy asks some deeper and often less fathomable questions about knowledge like, what is knowledge? How do we know that we know something? And what can we really know about objects and events? Some even claim that it's all in our heads and there are no objects or events out there. Pondering such general questions might be interesting. But in the real world, we have to find conclusions to our inquiries because we have to identify solutions we can use to maintain and improve our lives. As incomplete or faulty as our conclusions and derived applications might be, we must eventually try them to see what they can do for us. And if they are not satisfactory, we have to go back and ask some more questions and test the answers. Arguably, when we refine and increase our knowledge in this manner, we eventually know enough about a subject to not have to ask further questions. We settle into certain ways of looking at the world and us in it, certain modes of operating that have proven themselves to us or that we have otherwise accepted. Such customs and traditions can be useful because they allow us to cope with newly encountered circumstances without reinventing our responses each time. We learn to live with or even appreciate the security of this simplified regularity. But even here, it seems a good idea to question whether arising situations are sufficiently similar to warrant habitual responses or whether modifications are indicated. Even if we find a set of rules we can routinely apply, it is inherently human to not rest on such levels, but to use them as springboards for further inquiries. We cannot help wondering and trying to find out what lies beyond. This is how we develop. And as we develop, as we attain more knowledge, as we gather more and better tools to ascertain reality, our horizons extend and broaden, and both the granularity and context of our knowledge increase. This organically gives us different perspectives that make us question and amend previous views. Some of our inquiries are then generally explorative without concrete applications in mind. But most are geared to solve specific challenges. Many of these arise because our information or comprehension is not advanced or comprehensive enough. And many of our practical deficiencies may be sourced in lack of knowledge. Even if we can make matters work for us to a certain extent, we often can sense we are not in full control because we lack complete information about them. We do not like to be in such situations because we can anticipate that our lack of knowledge might harm us. Or, at the very least, we want to know how we can profit in our affairs and intentions from what we do not know yet. In all these cases, we inquire and test subjects of interest further to reach and maintain unfulfilled objectives. Even more challenging is often the coordination of research, knowledge, and application of specific subjects and areas of subjects. We need to fit our inquiries, answers, and implementations into a totality that comprises our existence. Such existential conditions constitute a hyper-complex system with many moving and changing parts. Its optimization for our purposes, and at times, just getting by in it, require constant questioning and adjustment. We might still insist there are subjects we have fully evaluated to finality, at least by themselves or in a limited setting we define. We might get away not asking further questions about them, or only how they relate to other subjects as these come into view. However, 
such exceptions from continued consideration run the risk of engendering complacency that prevents us from detecting issues regarding our knowledge. We might be so taken with our insight and control that we do not recognize deficiencies. We might falsely assume the depth and breadth of our knowledge about a subject is the end. We might ignore or dismiss contradictions or larger correlations that do not comport with our goals or our mapped paths toward them. And even if we should have reached adequate levels of assuredness regarding our knowledge, we might not be able to continue to be sure unless we keep questioning as things proceed. After all, we don't know what we don't know, and even known circumstances may change. Not all these ongoing inquiries entail change in how we respond. Periodic questioning related to changes in circumstances can also confirm the value of keeping established concepts and recipes in responding. Questioning also prepares us for transmitting our knowledge to others. Posing and answering our own questions can help us anticipate inquiries by those who look to us for competent answers. So I don't think there are many if any subjects where we can afford to just say that's it and not look into the many further. Questioning seems to be a natural and prudent part of human life and human nature. And yet, many try to prevent such questioning within themselves and by others, afraid of the insecurity and detrimental obstacles and changes this might entail. They might not want to know and might want to prevent others, from knowing much different than their convictions or conventional wisdom at the time. This fear may move them to condone, preserve, or pursue less than optimal conditions. To justify these, they may tell themselves, or hear from others, that the present status, although imperfect, is the best that can be achieved. Further questioning might be perceived as senseless, inefficient, offensive, and even destabilizing for a beneficial order. Human history and the present are filled with examples of such suppressions. They stand in the way of humans and humanity's survival and thriving to the best of our abilities. Fearlessly inquiring keeps us free to follow our potential. We should therefore never give up wanting to know, never give up philosophy as our most incisive instrument and precious right. But how can we possibly accomplish this in a rising civilization where looking into all aspects of our unfolding reality seems increasingly impossible for one or even a limited number of persons? The sheer amount of information seems overwhelming. However smart and learned we might be, we can cover only a small segment of inquiry and insight. And we are regularly confronted with information beyond our capacity to proficiently question and ascertain its actuality. To still cope with such circumstances forming our reality and shaping our existence, we must rely on others to conscientiously conduct inquiries and disclose to us and apply information relevant to our affairs. But this does not mean we should not question them. To make sure our reliance is justified, we must inquire about the truth of representations and wisdom of their implementations to our satisfaction. In these efforts, we must not only guard against those who would try to impress us that their insights confirm current and future conditions. We must also be wary of those who seek to influence our inquisitive minds for destabilizing and overturning valid and useful insights and derived standards. Even in cases of legitimately advocated changes, our interest in efficient transition requires that we operate under current conventions while we work on advancements. Striking a balance between our operating bases and forays requires continual questioning and adjusting. But, in either case, how should we go about questioning those with information and skills beyond our grasp? We need to question the speaker's motives and the factuality and completeness of their statements. We must ask for proof. Arguably, this causes us very much the same problems preventing us from competent inquiry and insight in the first place. In an advanced society, we likely do not possess adequate expertise and access to search out, evaluate, or pass judgment on proof. We can demand, however, that those making claims provide proof of them since their asserted authority signals they are familiar with relevant underlying facts. But assertions usually come with a related interest of having us accept them, which may cause bias in them and representations of their pertinent facts. 
To bridge the distance between us and those making claims and supporting representations, we will have to rely on independent third-party intermediaries with proven independence. We will have to rely on them to ask questions on our behalf and explain to us and discuss with us answers in terms we can understand to adeptly react. And we will have to empower these experts to those making claims and supporting representations provide full disclosure to them. Yet, here again, we must question such experts to reach and maintain adequate levels of confidence in them. In particular, we will have to assure that despite their sharing of expertise with those making statements to be proven, they remain committed to our protection and keep objective distance from those whose statements they analyze. We will also have to be vigilant that they do not abuse their positions. And finally, we must match our demands for transparency by committing to the application of such standards and checks to us when we make statements to others or review proof as intermediaries. The probably most difficult challenge, however, is that we apply reasonable and honest standards of proof and objectivity to our own observations, processing, and conclusions. Ignorance, lack of distance to ourselves, and unchecked or unrealized motivations may make questioning ourselves a thorny, uncertain undertaking. By giving into character flaws or blind spots that cause us not to adequately question ourselves, to presume or pretend we know, or to shortchange inquiries, we may mislead ourselves. And even the interrelational ideal of informational vetting is often not provided. In its absence, we must cope with the potentials of inaccuracy and incompleteness. To hone in on reliability, factuality, degrees of probability, context, comprehensiveness, and consequences to be drawn, we must increase our education and skepticism. We must question even more what anybody tells us. If we just accept or equivocate on what we are told without due consideration, we invite being intentionally or unintentionally misled or ignored. Sources may use our gullibility or apathy for their purposes, or they may just be and go wrong without corrective reactions. Both threats of ill-advisement have metastasized in our world lately. Averting our eyes, uncritically swallowing the ignorant claims or lies of others, and lying to ourselves and others pose problems that merit additional consideration. I am discussing these topics in my next blog article titled Bearing and Bearing False Witness, How Lying Destroys Liberal Societies.